start. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, zero, and lift off. Lift off. In our natural pursuit of knowledge, space has always mystified and beguiled us. Over the past five decades, we've pushed the final frontier inevitably onward into the ether. The cost has been colossal. Now, every day, new data, new conclusions, and the thirst for deeper exploration propel us inexorably onward. The advantages of the discoveries made through space travel are myriad, but the fundamental curiosity as to what is out there will always fascinate and taunt us. Come with us now into the unknown and discover the disappearing frontier. In this edition of The Disappearing Frontier, we continue our story on Project Mercury, a vital cog in the machinery that led to the achievement of the American dream, putting a man on the moon and having him return safely to Earth. But first, the pictures you're about to watch are of our journey towards the disappearing frontier. They are images of rare beauty as well as awe-inspiring accomplishment. Set to music, this vision supplied by NASA needs no words. So relax and gaze at the achievements that have been undertaken in the name of humankind.
There are things that are known and things that are unknown. In between is exploration. Nineteen sixty and sixty one were key years in the history of the USA's National Aeronautics and Space Administration, otherwise known as NASA. On April the 1st, 1960, the first US weather satellite was launched. Called Tyros 1, it produced almost 23,000 pictures of Earth's weather. This Tyros-1 experimental weather satellite provided dramatic pictures of cloud formations, including spiral formations associated with large aerial storms. Tyros-1 worked in a useful manner for 78 days. It's the world's first successful weather satellite, and ever since then, weather satellites have helped in weather prediction and save lives and property through storm detection. Meanwhile, in the manned program, astronauts continue training for space flights in the Mercury capsule. They practice with a space flight simulator. Strapped in firmly, the astronauts would spin around, first one, then all three axes. They also carried out exercises in bringing the spacecraft under control if the need arose. The spacecraft in orbit travels at a speed which balances very delicately the pull of Earth's gravity. To simulate weightlessness in space, the astronauts would take up positions in an aeroplane which would then descend, beginning a steep climb. As the aircraft decelerates, it eases over the top in a parabolic arc. For short periods, its occupants are weightless. Another first for NASA, the launch of ECHO-1, the first passive communication satellite. ECHO-1 is really a big balloon. From it, radio signals are bounced, relaying signals between distant locations on Earth. Millions on Earth saw ECHO as a moving pinpoint of light in the night sky. Later communication satellites were much more complicated. They were active, not passive. They carried antennae, receivers, transmitters, and other equipment. It was these early satellites that began the communications revolution. Modern satellites receive signals transmitted up from Earth and retransmit an amplified signal to distant locations. News, sports, entertainment, television, telephone, facsimile, and other communications are now routinely transmitted via satellite. In 1961, NASA was also preparing for manned spaceflight. The Mercury ground network included 18 stations. Stations like Bermuda, here undergoing inter-systems checkout. Bermuda station duplicated the control center on the mainland. It's April 1961 and workers have the station ready for operation. Other workers complete the final two stations in Nigeria and Zanzibar. Back in the United States, scientists simulated orbital flights for training. During 1961, this unmanned test shot is ready for blast off. The launch fails. But the escape system works, raising confidence for later manned flights. In 
In May 1961, astronaut Alan Shepard prepares for the first US manned spaceflight with a Mercury capsule. The craft is to rise over 100 miles into space in a suborbital flight. Officials schedule the launch for early morning on May the 2nd, 1961. Weather postpones the launch. On May the 5th, Shepard goes to the launch complex. It's just two years and seven months since the start of Project Mercury. As countless millions watch and listen, the astronaut manually controls his craft and has almost continuous communication with Earth. The Mercury Redstone rocket travels 300 miles and reaches an altitude of 115 miles. Shepard enjoys about five minutes of weightlessness. About 16 minutes after liftoff, the spacecraft is found. A helicopter picks up Shepard, then his Freedom 7 spacecraft. The Mercury suborbital flight is a success for the USA, but the Russian astronaut Yuri Gagarin has already orbited the Earth and in a heavier spacecraft. The then President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, asks his Vice President, Lyndon Johnson, to head a study of what is needed for America to get ahead of the Soviets in the space race. NASA's 10-year plan calls for a manned orbital flight around the moon. The question is, can the U.S. be the first nation to orbit a man around the moon? The technical answer is maybe not. So the proposal is made that the goal be extended to the surface of the moon. On May 25, 1961, President Kennedy speaks before a joint session of Congress to define the new national goal. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. The president tells the assembly that this is the time for a great new I American that enterprise. This should commit itself to time for the nation to take a clearly leading role in space out, achievement, which he said could in many ways hold the key to America's to future on Earth. He went on to state his goal that before the decade was out, to land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. It was an awesome challenge for NASA to facilitate the president's dream it was decided that a two-man Earth orbital spacecraft called Gemini must be developed as the step between the one-man Mercury capsule and the Apollo craft, which was destined to fly men to the moon and back. Project Gemini's mission was to learn more about man's capability during longer periods of weightlessness and to train astronauts to maneuver and rendezvous spacecraft during flight. The two-man spacecraft was further developed the Titan II rocket was acquired from the Air Force and adapted for Gemini. It's now confirmed that Gemini will be the link between Earth orbital and manned lunar spaceflight. In October 1961, NASA had already received proposals for a three-man spacecraft for moon missions. While these were being evaluated, engineers and scientists were meeting with industry people to discuss the design and building of the Apollo craft. Companies presented various models, and on November the 29th, officials selected the North American Aviation Corporation from California to be the prime contractor to produce an Apollo spacecraft. Unmanned orbital tests continue. On one of these carried a chimpanzee, which was followed by two manned suborbital flights. Explorer 10 was launched during 1961, the 79-pound satellite gathered facts about solar winds, Earth's magnetic field, and its reaction to solar flares. 
Then the 82-pound Explorer 11, which detects gamma rays from cosmic sources and maps their locations in the sky. This is the first attempt at this type of satellite space astronomy. Explorer 12 was launched into a highly elliptical Earth orbit. It investigated solar wind, interplanetary magnetic fields and energetic particles in the Van Allen belt. The second manned suborbital US spaceflight with astronaut Virgil Grissom aboard is a success, but the spacecraft is to sink in the ocean. Grissom experiences one and a half Gs. The flight surgeon closely watches the test pilot's condition during flight. Grissom's vital signs are okay. At engine cutoff, the spacecraft makes its turnaround and the astronaut is weightless. The retrieval helicopters are within two miles of the landing point. Grissom says he's ready for pickup. As the lead helicopter moves in to hook the capsule, the side hatch is blown off and Grissom is forced to leave the rapidly filling spacecraft. The recovery helicopter struggles with the almost submerged craft. The helicopter is overtaxed by a thousand pounds. A second helicopter moves in to pick up the astronaut. Grissom has trouble staying afloat. After four anxious minutes, Grissom struggles into the horse collar. The lead helicopter's motor apparently malfunctions. The spacecraft drops. Project Mercury continues in high gear, pointing towards a manned orbital mission. On May the 13th, 1961, NASA puts an unmanned Mercury into orbit. One test objective is met early in flight. The Atlas releases the spacecraft into proper orbit. One hour and 49 minutes after launch, the spacecraft lands 200 miles east of Bermuda. In November of 1961, a notable Mercury flight because of its passenger, Enos the Chimpanzee. The chimp, weighing 39 pounds, was put in a special couch with a water feeder. During pre-launch testing, Enos was connected to the spacecraft's environmental system. Fitted with numerous biosensors, the primate is closely monitored by scientists through a series of tests. Enos is then transferred to a Mercury spacecraft and prepared for launch. About an hour into the flight, the spacecraft passes over Australia. Five minutes later, the Woomera tracking station in Australia confirms that all systems are green. A 16mm camera gives a periscope eye view of the cloud formation and the island dotted Pacific on a condensed time film. Going into the second orbit, tracking stations report steadily rising spacecraft temperatures. Midway through the first leg of the second flight, the Nigeria tracking station reports the craft is recording intermittent roll and ignore signals. A slight rise in the chimp's temperature causes some concern among the flight surgeons. Officials decide not to fly the spacecraft into a third orbit and they order retrofire.
The descent, landing and recovery are all normal. That afternoon, at a press conference at Cape Canaveral, NASA officials say they're pleased with the flight. Also at the conference, astronaut John Glenn, who will be the test pilot for the first manned orbital Mercury mission. And Scott Carpenter will be back up. Meanwhile, Enos, the history-making chimpanzee, made a triumphant return to the Cape. Whilst in the laboratory, technicians closely examined the recovered mercury capsule and carried out a variety of tests. Eminent cardiologists were asked to review the records and biological data obtained during the orbital flight of Enos to determine the reason for the arrhythmia, if possible, and to separate it from the influences exerted by weightlessness in space flight. It was found that the difficulty lay with the instrumentation and that the data was therefore invalid. Accordingly, it was recommended that the manned orbital flight should proceed as scheduled. Nineteen sixty and nineteen sixty one. Two eventful years in NASA history, and two years that proved to be vital in achieving the goal of putting man on the moon and having him safely returned to the Earth. That brings us to the end of this edition. We look forward to your company next time. But remember, we are out there. What we can and can't see is out there. And the mysteries between us, although seemingly insurmountable, are encompassed by a disappearing frontier. <laughs>